Hello plant lovers, Matthew in Melbourne, welcoming you to my channel. And if this is your first time here, welcome. Today is my first care collaboration. I was asked by Jess of Attainable Greens to do a care collaboration video about Miltoniopsis. So thank you, Jess, from Attainable Greens for asking me. And this video is part of a care collaboration series and all of the other participants you will see below. But their channels are G's Orchids, DLQ, Orchid Saga, and we've all been there, Attainable Green, obviously, Matt by Nature, Rogers Orchids, and Anoviogia, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Do check everyone else's videos. We're all posting on the same day and it's all about Miltoniopsis care in different parts of the world. So no matter where you are, you should hopefully find some tricks and help and assistance perhaps with growing your own Miltoniopsis. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. It's midwinter, which is why I'm on the stairs because it's the best winter light. I'll show you where Melbourne is. I'm in Southeast Australia and we don't really have the same climatic zone ality as you do in the USA in Australia. So suffice to say that Melbourne is described as either a cool Mediterranean or a warm temperate climate. And what that means is that we have cold wet winters that don't freeze and we have hot dry summers that can also be a little wet and a little cold. Which means that I tend to grow orchids that are cold, cool or intermediate only. And I do post every week, so hit subscribe if that is of interest. But plant lovers, with no further ado, let us take a deep dive into Miltoniopsis. Luckily, mine is in bloom, or this particular one is. And this one, as you can see, is called Kelly Spangled Banner. I do sometimes have issues with names, and I'm sure Kelly was lovely, but I don't really see the Spangled Banner of it. But anyway, who cares? That's what it's called. And as you can see, it sort of has a banana yellow background with this beautiful magenta interior and almost an orange inset with those bright yellow parts in the middle. It is a beautiful flower. So let's do some, let me put the label back in and let's do some Miltoniopsis 101. I have made other videos about Miltoniopsis, which I will link at the end. But this is now well into my second year, so I've made some learnings which aren't in my other videos, which I will share in this one. But let's go to the very beginning. So Miltoniopsis as a species is found in the north of South America, fairly high altitudes in sort of damp, woody environments and forests, which is a clue as to its ideal growing conditions. It is not a tropical orchid, so it is a, and this is where the story gets complicated. It is a cool growing orchid, but I would say cool to intermediate. What that means for me here in Melbourne is that this orchid doesn't like temperatures that are really much below 10 degrees centigrade, which is about 55 Fahrenheit, but even that's a little on the chilly side. So I have made the executive decision to keep mine indoors all winter because plant lovers, I experimented and nearly came a cropper. So this Kelly Spangled Banner is a beautiful, vigorous, healthy plant, as you can see, which Miltoniopsis tend to be when they're happy, very, very vigorous growers. But this baby here, as you can see, you know, it's not so bad, but you can probably see the remnants of lots of leaf damage, which I've had to chop off. Lots of new growth, but nonetheless, not a happy plant. And this one, just out of curiosity's sake, is called Burt field leash and this is um, basically just like a strong magenta red beautiful almost monochrome flower but almost a year ago to the day it uh, it's winter you know in Melbourne and we had a particularly cold snap this time last year where temperatures got down to one degree Celsius which is what is that you know 35 36 degrees Fahrenheit it was almost at freezing point, which is very unusual for Melbourne. And I had it on fairly good authority that Miltoniopsis were cold tolerant. So I had decided to winter mine outside all year. So they're undercover, protected from the rain, and they get bright filtered light. So that's all good. But nonetheless, it is outside and the temperature plummeted. The next morning, what do I find? And you can still, I think, see the remnants of it, but essentially the plants got burnt by the cold. Can you see? It looks like sun damage, but in fact it was cold damage. So the leaves, I guess, almost froze. Poor darling, poor darling. And so the other thing I'm here to tell you is that Miltoniopsis are forgiving, but it takes a while. <laughs> so this one, it was damaged almost a year ago, in fact exactly a year ago. And it, I brought them inside immediately and cursed myself for making the mistake. They didn't die. 
they probably just sat for quite a few months and just sulked, I think, and recovered. I kept them in bright filtered light inside. I watered them moderately, a little bit of fertilizer, but just, you know, kept them in a holding pattern. And so really towards the middle of last year, it started to send out new growths, which made me incredibly happy. But anyway, I've probably jumped the gun and let's just go back to some basics about Miltoniopsis. I think unduly they have a bit of a bad rap for being difficult and I have to kind of say that after Phalaenopsis these were actually my first orchids to bloom so there you go it can't be that difficult because I am plant lovers a rank amateur. So I think the thing about Miltoniopsis is firstly where they come from high altitude and it's quite damp forest so the important thing to remember I think is that unlike lots of orchids these don't necessarily want or need a dry rest in winter so depending where you are obviously now I'm in Melbourne as you know the climate here is is mild uh, and these orchids are indoors in winter and I take them outdoors in summer where they're protected from the rain and they have filtered natural light so quite bright and lots of breeze um, but the temperatures can get reasonably high in summer obviously and moderately low at night so the thing is that these orchid types don't like to dry out now a lot of orchids you can be quite neglectful of you can go away on holiday and just leave them for a month and they will be fine but Miltoniopsis won't die but it doesn't love being dried out and the concertina leaves, which you can see here, they say are an indicator that you haven't watered enough when the leaves are emerging, for example. It's a bit of a fine balance. How do you define watering? For me, it's literally a bit of common sense. Depends where you are and how hot the ambient environment is. So in summer, obviously, when it's hotter, I water a little often. And that could mean once every two days. Depends how hot it is. I don't drench it, I just give it a little the same amount of milk that you put in tea. As the weather cools down, I just keep my eye on it. So at the moment, I can tell by the weight of it that the medium inside is still moderately moist, so I'm not gonna water it again for a bit. But when I do, I will literally just dribble a little bit of water around the base, around the medium, just to moisten the top, so I don't drench it. So I think one of the pitfalls to fall into, <laughs> what a pit is when orchids are described as as needing to be kept moist is that you tend to overwater it so finding that perfect balance and for me that is a little often unless it gets too wet let it dry out a little bit but don't let the medium dry out completely is that clear so that's the watering and I think that is often the the problem for a lot of people trying to grow Miltoniopsis the other thing obviously is humidity. Um, they're not, I don't find it particularly fussy about humidity, but I do miss this when it's indoors. In winter, obviously there's ambient heating in the house, which can be a little drying. So I give it a spritz, maybe once a day when I walk past. Again, not religious about that, but I do tend to spritz it because I feel it needs a freshen up. And when it's outdoors in summer, the whole area gets pretty well watered. So there's plenty of, uh, of humidity in the atmosphere there. But really, I treat this like a fairly average houseplant, I have to say, plant lovers. Um, it doesn't get particularly special care from me. Likewise, pretty standard for most orchids, bright, indirect light. It doesn't like super strong light or direct sunlight. The leaves will burn very quickly. You can feel they're quite thin and fine. Um, but it does like to be on the brighter spectrum of the indirect light spectrum. I pot all my orchids in terracotta pots because I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy. Does mean you have to pay more attention though because they do dry out faster, but one of the benefits of that is they evaporate quite quickly. They create a little mini humidifying around the orchid and they keep the roots dry. Whereas with a plastic pot, it can retain moisture and you can start to get a bit of uh, root rot if you're not onto it. Um, obviously plastic is lighter and a bit more convenient and if you get clear ones you can see the roots and understand the health of the plant but for me it's aesthetic too I just find terracotta more pleasing to the eye and we need to reduce our use of plastic so we've done light we've done water the next thing is food once a year I give this a sprinkling of a slow release general fertilizer pellet trying not to get it anywhere near the roots because it can blast them it's like binging on McDonald's so and I will probably just put a, t a small sprinkle like 
maybe not even a quarter of a teaspoon, not much at all. And then during the growing season or when you can see spikes coming, I tend to give it maybe once every two weeks a diluted watering with a seaweed based fertilizer. And I dilute that to about one eighth of the recommended dose on the bottle. And then instead of that, when I see the spikes emerging, I will give it a bloom specific high nitrogen again soluble fertilizer in one of the regular waterings and again I dilute that quite a lot at least one eighth I don't tend to overdo it with the food so that's the basic care for me fairly straightforward the thing to remember I guess the other point is they are really vigorous growers and you can see that this has almost reached the outside of the pot now it's in bloom right now and there's another spike there. So when those flowers are done and when it's spring in Melbourne, which is sort of October-ish, I will repot this and go up a size. I won't go deeper with the pot, but I'll go wider. So flowering. Now, firstly, the flowers are really beautiful and you can see why its common name is the pansy orchid. It's just stunning and it does look like a pansy. And the fragrance, it's really subtle and it's really beautiful but when mine are in bloom I put them on the dining table and you can really smell it it's not overpowering but it's a beautiful subtle fragrance it's like a room fragrance or a potpourri and mine smells weirdly a bit like marigolds a spicy marigold mix now flowering um, this one for me Kelly Spangled Banner tends to flower twice a year it tends to flower in autumn and in spring the flowers last for weeks they're very long lasting and the fragrance tends to be most active from the middle part of the day so from about 10 a.m. to about 3 34 p.m. then it starts to just switch off as the pollinators disappear but here's the thing this one was just in bloom and you can maybe see the spent spike here so I literally just cut that off about a week ago because this spike was in full bloom and now I have another one here so it's going to be in fairly constant bloom for the next few months which is great because it's a beautiful orchid so that's a bit of a first for me to kind of have those sequential um, flower spikes but I read it's not that unusual in cultivation for these to do that and blooming wise as you can see and I'll come in and take a close-up um, you have your new growth which matures relatively quickly and it's those new pseudobulbs that flower and you'll get one of these new growths to mature within about six months so they're quite vigorous hence you can get two flowerings a year which means the name of the game is obviously to promote vegetative growth because it's from these that you're going to get your flower spikes and I will come in and show you closer but as you can see that the flower spike like many particularly like many on, on city orchids comes from inside the leaf there just near the pseudobulb now here's a problem I've noticed with mine and I'll come in and show you on this spike is that sometimes as the spike is coming out of that sort of leaf sheath it's actually bent over like that and it pushes its way up and then it straightens and goes straight up but what has happened with mine a few times is that the leaf has been so tight that as the orchid pushes it doesn't straighten and actually it dies at that juncture because it doesn't straighten up and energy doesn't move up the flower spike and enable it to mature so I've noticed that a few times and I noticed it just in time on this one and was able to sort of open out the leaf and give it more space there is still a crick in it which I'll show you but there was another flower spike and I didn't notice that in time and it got stuck and withered and died so I am really cross about that because that pseudobulb is not going to flower again so that's one thing to keep your eye on when you can see the flower spikes emerging just make sure that the leaf is open enough for that flower spike to grow up properly the only other problem I've ever had with this is which is a new problem and it bothers me is aphids now aphids love flower spikes on orchids they love the bloom buds because it's so juicy and easy for them to stick their proboscis in and suck dry so I have noticed a few on this plant indoors which is a bit of a bother so I use an organic oil spray on that and I would do it for a couple of weeks and then that should generally deal with the problem and once you can see all the aphids are dead I do then wipe the leaves with um, kitchen paper damp kitchen paper just to get that excess oil off because I do feel it might clog the cells <laughs> like the best of us so a bit of a cleanse tone and moisturize after I've used the oil treatment after it has worked so that's the only problems I have potting wise it is in a fairly typical potting mix for me which is a loose bark mix with a bit of perlite a bit of charcoal a tiny bit of shell grit which is actually a chicken food but the shell grit is full of calcium it also helps aerate the mix 
and my secret is a little sprinkling of mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi serve the purpose of promoting healthy root growth, but they also enable a plant to draw and access the nutrients from whatever the soil and medium it's planted in. So the mycorrhizal fungi almost acts as the go-between between the root and the nutrient. So those shell grits full of calcium, for example, the mycorrhizal fungi help take out the calcium and make it available for the plant. You can get mycorrhizal fungi online anywhere. Uh, just don't inhale it. <laughs> like many things, just be careful. So there we go. Uh, back to last year. So this one, as we can see, I've got new growths coming. Um, the other growths did mature and they would have been covered in blooms, but they were so burnt and damaged by the cold that they're just sulking a little bit. But I think to start with, I think this might be slightly over potted. So Miltoniopsis do like to be a bit more constrained. So I think what I'm going to do in spring when the weather's a bit warmer, is just repot this, go down a size and refresh the medium because it has had, it's had a lot of trauma, but I'm really looking forward to that blooming. The color is amazing. I guess the other thing is the name Miltoniopsis. It was named after a guy called Viscount Milton. And in fact, Miltonia, that species group was the first name and then Miltoniopsis sort of broke away from it because it was realized they were two different plants. And in fact, I have a Miltonia here and this one is called Guanabara and it has uh, a beautiful sort of mauve monochrome flower, but it's very lovely. But I think here's an interesting thing that you can see the two main differences between Miltonia and Miltoniopsis is that the pseudobulb has two leaves at the top, whereas on a Miltoniopsis, can we find one? There we go, there's a pseudobulb there. And can you see there is just one leaf at the top of the pseudobulb. So that is the first difference. The other difference is you can see that the Miltoniopsis pseudobulb is quite round and plump, whereas the Miltonia pseudobulb is much more elongated. It's a good twice as long as the Miltoniopsis pseudobulb. I find Miltonia need a lot more humidity and moisture than their Miltoniopsis cousins. And this one flowered for me about a year ago and it hasn't flowered since. As you can see, growth's going mad, probably needs to be repotted. Uh, but I've got two matured pseudobulbs, so that should bloom in spring. But anyway, this is a Miltoniopsis video, not a Miltonia video. So let's put that baby aside and let's then just say thank you very much for watching. I'm really curious to see everyone else's videos about what they're doing with their Miltoniopsises, Miltoniopsi, wherever they are in the world. So thank you for including me. I hope this has been useful and interesting. And don't be afraid of Miltoniopsis. I guess that is my rule of thumb. I treat this just as I would treat any other indoor plant and it's blooming and happy and not tricky at all. So thank you plant lovers, do hit subscribe if you want to keep up with my regular amateur, very amateur orchid adventures and I look forward to seeing you next week. But in the meantime, thank you for watching this Miltoniopsis Care collaboration. Check out the other collaborators down below and I'll see you next week.